Welcome to 340B Insight from 340B Health. Hello from Washington, D.C., and welcome back to 340B Insight, the podcast about the 340B drug pricing program. I'm David Glendinning with 340B Health. This is a very special episode of 340B Insight. Today, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the 340B drug pricing program, which became law on November 4th, 1992. As part of our commemoration of this big date, our guest today is a member of Congress who was a principal architect of the legislation that brought 340B to life. Congressman Henry Waxman spent 40 years serving his nation and his California constituents in the U.S. House of Representatives. As the top Democrat on the influential House Energy and Commerce Committee, Congressman Waxman put a major imprint on the healthcare system that is still visible today. Leading a bipartisan group of lawmakers that made 340B possible is one entry in a long list of major healthcare legislative accomplishments over the congressman's career. He also either wrote or played a leading role in passing major health policy bills that include the Affordable Care Act, the Waxman Hatch Generic Drug Act, the Orphan Drug Act, the Ryan White Care Act, the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, and the FDA user fee laws, just to name a few. The congressman gained widespread recognition for his work on Capitol Hill, with the Washington Post dubbing him one of the most accomplished legislators of our time. And Senator Alan Simpson, a Republican from Wyoming known for his colorful speech, described Congressman Waxman as tougher than a boiled owl. Today, the congressman serves as chairman at Waxman Strategies, a public affairs and strategic communications firm here in Washington, D.C. His firm advises clients, including 340B Health, in public policy areas that include healthcare, the environment, energy, technology, and communications. Our own Richard Sorian recently sat down with Congressman Henry Waxman to discuss the major part the congressman played in the 1992 enactment of 340B, the eventful 30-year history of 340B since then, and 340B's prominent place in the healthcare safety net today. Here's that conversation. Thank you, David. It's a real pleasure to step in for Miles today to conduct this interview with former Congressman Henry Waxman. I have a little secret to share with our listeners in the early part of my career here in Washington. I was a reporter covering healthcare policy, and I'm sure I lost count of the number of times I sat down with Mr. Waxman at that time, so it's a great sense of deja vu for me today. Welcome, Mr. Chairman, to 340B Insight. Thank you very much, Richard. I, I guess we've known each other for many decades. I have a high regard for your knowledge about healthcare policy and the kind of job you do, so I'm happy to participate in this interview. In your time in Congress, you spent a lot of your time building and protecting the healthcare safety net. Why does our country need a strong healthcare safety net? We need a strong healthcare safety net because there are millions of Americans living below or just slightly above the poverty line. They often don't have access to private health insurance, or if they do, they still can't afford it. So we've built this healthcare safety net to make sure people and families living with low incomes, get the care they need, and of course, they deserve it. And we have set up programs like Medicare for seniors and disabled people, Medicaid for a lot of low-income people, the Veterans Administration, the military health care system. We also have a network of public health clinics to deliver services to people in their communities. We try to protect the institutions that provide this care, so they're there for the long term. A lot of them don't have the ability to get reimbursed for the full cost of the care that they're giving to people who either have no insurance or they're underinsured. So uh, other providers in the private system can shift their costs onto the patients that do have insurance that will pay the full cost of the care. But for the safety net providers, they incur losses for carrying so many of these public insured and uninsured and underinsured patients. We need to make sure that the safety net covers them so that they don't go out of business. Some people would argue that the enactment of the Affordable Care Act makes the notion of a safety net 
obsolete. We don't need it anymore. Do they have a point? We need a safety net just as strong or even stronger today than when we created many of these programs. Health care costs a lot. Far too many people can't afford to receive basic care, that they need to stay healthy. And when illness or injury strikes, the economic impact on families that cannot afford care can be devastating. This is a, a critical need for the health care safety net in rural communities. And the Affordable Care Act has done a lot to extend access to Medicaid and to provide private health insurance for people living at or slightly above the poverty line, but it didn't eliminate the need for the safety net. People have their insurance in a number of different ways, and the ACA allowed people to get private insurance or Medicaid for their coverage when they couldn't get that insurance through their jobs or they were barred from private insurance because of pre-existing medical conditions. The ACA covered health care access by expanding the abilities for people without insurance to get insurance and not be denied it in the private health care system or to get their insurance through Medicaid. But we still need that safety net as much now as we did before the ACA was adopted. Another major focus of your time in Congress was the price of drugs, prescription drugs in particular. You worked out an agreement with Senator Orrin Hatch, who was a Republican from Utah, to extend the patent time for some drugs while accelerating approval of generic drugs. In retrospect, do you still think it's a good deal? I think what we did in the mid-1980s when Hatch and I got together and said, let's support legislation that would do two things. It would give the drug companies an extension on their patent, their exclusive patent to produce the drug while they're at FDA. Because while they're at FDA, they can't sell their drug, so they can't make any income from it. They felt they were getting their patent time cut. And so we said, okay, we'll restore some of the patent time but when that patent is finished, we want immediate competition from a generic drug man manufacturer to come in and compete. And that competition would lower the price with a generic that was the same medicine as the original drug, but it's less expensive. So Hatch and I reached an agreement on this bill, and it's been known as the Hatch-Waxman Act when Senator Hatch recently died, a lot was mentioned as, as uh, this bill was one of his accomplishments. And I think it was a, one of the major achievements that uh, we are both able to participate in accomplishing. These days, bipartisanship seems like an obsolete idea. You were obviously a strong partisan Democrat, but you worked with uh, Republicans on a lot of legislation. Do you think that we can get back to a state where that can happen again? We've got to get back to uh, bipartisanship. I was the author of many bills that became law, probably more than most people in their careers. But there was only one bill where we didn't have bipartisan support, and that was the Affordable Care Act. Otherwise, with the generic drug uh, bill, with the Orphan Drug Act, with the Child Health Insurance Program, with expansions on Medicaid, Medi-Cal, and Medicare. All of those programs had bipartisan support. They weren't unanimous, but we had bipartisan support. In fact, we often had Republican presidents that had to sign the bills. So in 1992, for example, it was President George H.W. Bush that signed the uh, bill into law that had the 340B authorization. We need bipartisanship. We, I always sought to achieve it. I hope we can go back to the point where we can look at a problem, hear each other's ideas, come up with compromises. A lot of people act as if a compromise is a dirty word. I think a compromise is essential to getting things done, and it makes the product better because you get more people giving their ideas how to make it better. So uh, we're, we're going to have to go to back to that and if we look back at the, so much of what we're talking about now, 
like the 340B program. It was a bipartisan program when it was first adopted in 1992, and it's continued to be bipartisan to cover not just people getting a lower discounted price for the drugs, but for the institutions, especially for the institutions that serve them, to be able to have the ability to have the income generated so they could extend services to a lot of low-income people, not just any one individual. So as, as you mentioned, you were uh, one of the leaders that wrote the 340B program into law. What was the thinking on Capitol Hill and your thinking at the time uh, that led to the enactment of 340B? Well, it was adopted in 1992, and we were facing high price for drugs. That was too high for people to buy it. Congress didn't have levers to lower the price of drugs, so companies had to restrain their pricing if they, if they would, but we couldn't protect most people buying drugs. We had programs like Medicaid and the VA, and since they were public programs, we could insist that they get the best price possible for a drug. But we wanted other providers of care in the safety net program to have the opportunity to also receive the best price possible. So there was bipartisan support for protecting the health care safety net. And programs like Medicaid and Medicare could cut back on the amount that they would pay for the care that they were giving, but they didn't have private insurers paying a higher price for their services so they could take a lower price for Medicare and Medicaid and then a higher price for private insurance. They needed a protection for the safety net and a bit of a curb on the drug company pricing And this helped them recover what the uh, safety net public programs were able to pay at a lower price and give them that ability to get a discount on the drugs and have money left over to provide additional services to low-income people. You talked a little bit about the Affordable Care Act. One of the other things that the ACA did is it expanded access to 340B to critical access hospitals, rural referral centers, sole community hospitals, cancer hospitals, and children's hospitals. What led you to do that as part of the ACA? Well, these ideas, again, were bipartisan, even though the legislation passed only with Democratic votes. But Senators John Thune, a Republican from South Dakota, and Jeff Bingman, a Democrat from New Mexico, were worried about the state of rural health care especially rural hospitals. Critical access hospitals are small. They could have 25 or fewer beds and are at least 35 miles from the nearest hospital itself. These hospitals serve communities that have been historically underserved. So this expansion to them was critically important. We've seen a wave of rural hospital closures in the last 20 years. I can't imagine how much worse this whole problem would be if They didn't have 340B to keep them going. It was a well-needed, long-overdue expansion of the 340B program. So the pharmaceutical industry lately has been saying that 340B has gotten too big and needs to be reduced in size and scope. Do you think they have a point? I can't see the reason for the drug companies feeling sorry for themselves. After all, they're one of the most profitable industries around. They make a tremendous amount of profit on their drugs. They get to set the price for the most part. And now they're complaining that they're being deprived of the small extra amount of money they would make if the prices they have set for everybody else could also be applied to those who get 340B discounts. They don't want to give discounts. They want the highest price from everybody. I don't see there's a reason for sympathy for such an argument from an industry that's doing so well. The 340B program was not just to give discounts for low-income people, but to give the ability for the institutions, the care providers, the clinics and the hospitals and others, so that they could give a break on the price of drugs to those who, for whom they could, uh, are entitled to get it, and then have extra money aside from that that they're saving with this discount 
it's a revenue stream that they can use to expand care to a lot of low-income patients. There are now 18 large drug companies that have um, imposed restrictions on 340B pricing for drugs dispensed in community and specialty pharmacies. HRSA has taken steps to enforce the law, but the companies have gone to court to block them. What can Congress do about a situation like this? Well, they're not following the law when these companies are not willing to sell the drugs at the discounted price and set up barriers to that sale. HRSA is the agency at the Department of Health and Human Services that's there to enforce the law. But then when the courts are being used by the companies to stop HRSA, there's little avenue where, where we can do anything except one of the things that I learned is it's not just passing legislation, but doing oversight. And members of Congress in the House and the Senate, Democrats and Republicans, have been writing to HRSA and telling them, enforce the law. Push, they pushed the Trump administration. Now they're pushing the Biden administration to enforce the 340B statute. And I know this administration is, uh, is trying to respond to those calls. But everybody's got to keep the pressure on these companies and this industry. Persistent pressure is often the only way to get the result we want. And uh, since these are illegal practices, until the law is being enforced through the courts, if, if need be, we just have to keep the pressure on them to say that they're violating the, the 340B program. They're trying to rewrite the law themselves and we've got to have providers keep demonstrating to their elected officials how they use a 340B program to help their patients in need, not just those who are individually entitled to a discount, but the ability of the provider to extend more services to the low-income people. So you mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act a little earlier and how it will allow Medicare to begin negotiating prices for a small group of drugs. You know, that was something that was a priority of yours when you were in Congress. How do you think this came to pass? And do you think there'll be a real impact on drug prices? Well, there's definitely going to be a real impact on drug prices. Uh, the ability to negotiate the prices for Medicare, which is one of the major purchasers of drugs, is going to make a big difference. Now, it's not going to happen overnight, but it took the leadership from the president and President Biden and the members, uh, the leaders in the Congress to get this done. It happened because the drug companies continued to raise their prices year after year, and they thought Congress would never act. Well, finally, Congress did act, and it's an important law. It's either going to have some direct and indirect effects on drug company pricing. They're going to, go, they're going to negotiate some drug prices, but there are penalties if they start increasing the cost of any drug more than the cost of living. These penalties are very similar to the ones we put in place 30 years ago when we created the 340B program. Those penalties have served as a curb on egregious price increases, and I'm hopeful that these new penalties will have an even greater impact. Thinking back on what you wanted to achieve with 340B and how well it's performed, how do you think it's done? We should be very proud of the program. And I think it's done a great job because it's lowered the cost of buying drugs for nonprofit hospitals, community health centers, Ryan White centers, other public health clinics. Uh, these are the frontline resources for care for people who are uninsured or who have low incomes and for people who live in often un underserved rural parts of the country. So 340B has helped preserve the safety net during a time of economic upheaval and a global pandemic. Things would be so much worse if we didn't have the 340B program. So finally, I think we also have to acknowledge that 340B stands out because it does a lot of good, but it doesn't cost the taxpayers any money. And there are very few things we can do today where we get a good result without having to pay more of our tax dollars. Well, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for your time today. I also want to thank you on behalf of the 340B providers who listen to this show. The work you did in Congress on this, but on so many other things, 
uh, makes their jobs that much easier and makes them able to take care of patients who otherwise couldn't afford to get the care they need. So in addition to wishing 340B a happy birthday, we want to wish you a, a very big thank you for the work you've done and the work you continue to do today. Thank you, Richard, for those nice comments. And I want to thank all the 340B providers because they're there to give back up to make sure that the safety net for low-income people who would otherwise not get healthcare services, they're the backup to make sure that happens, to fill out the gaps in some of the public programs and the private insurance so that we're making the promise of care in a safety net real. And that's so important to them, and it's important for our whole country. Our thanks again to Congressman Henry Waxman for sharing his firsthand perspective on the legislative genesis of 340B in 1992 and his thoughts on 340B today as we mark its 30th anniversary. We salute the congressman for his long and distinguished service, and we recognize the lasting and positive impact he has had on strengthening the healthcare safety net for the benefit of all patients in need. We also are celebrating all your stories from the past three decades as we reflect on 340B turning 30. As always, we thank you for everything you do for your patients, and we are proud to be supporting you in this important work. Since our last episode, multiple 340B news developments have occurred, including in the contract pharmacy dispute. We have links in the show notes to help you keep up to date. We will be back in a couple of weeks with our next episode. In the meantime, thanks for listening and be well. Thanks for listening to 340B Insight. Subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information, visit our website at 340bpodcast.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at 340B Health and submit a question or idea to the show by emailing us at podcast at 340bhealth.org.